So for this panel, you know, it's titled Technical Challenges um, to Mainstream Deployment. So we're going to focus um, on the problem space, just try to get a really level set. We had a, a very lively discussion of the different consensus protocols out there and some of those considerations. But I'm hoping to ground this conversation uh, in some more specific examples for those of you guys who are looking at blockchains, um, following the debate on how to have sustainable, scalable um, infrastructure and what the trade-offs of each proposals might be. So uh, with that in mind, maybe you guys can do a quick introduction on what you guys are working on and then we'll, we'll jump right into it. Is it already on? Oh, okay, yeah, sounds like. My name is Greg Meredith. Uh, I'm a mathematician working with uh, Vlad and the, the Casper team at Ethereum on uh, the proof of stake protocol called Casper uh, for you know the next generation of Ethereum. Peter Todd, I do Bitcoin core development, and I actually came back from the scaling Bitcoin conference in Hong Kong, where we're trying to go make Bitcoin scale. Sarah Mickeljohn, um, I'm sort of looking at loosening different requirements of sort of the consensus protocol or the trust assumptions um, to see if you can generate sort of more scalable uh, and other benefit type solutions. Hey, I'm Vlad, I'm a, I'm a researcher at Ethereum. I'm looking at how we can um, make scalable solutions that survive in these environments with really like pessimistic trust assumptions, where basically the only thing I want to trust is that uh, people don't want to lose money. And that um, you know, people can calculate hashes and verify signatures. So um, you know, one thing that's coming out of these conversations that's very clear is that each of these proposals um, and and even identifying the problem in many cases uh, is an issue of what what values or trade offs you really believe in, because really each decision requires often a, a, a trade off in another. Um, Vlad, can you talk a little bit about proof of stake uh, and what potential trade-offs you're considering in those designs? Um, and then we'll, we'll also bring that over to Bitcoin and also what was discussed at the Hong Kong Scalability Conference. So um, the kind of proof of stake protocol that I'm interested in is called the security deposit based proof of stake. And the main consideration is um, under what conditions you take away how much of the deposits from the people who are involved in securing the networks. So, um, we have to kind of specify in what outcomes, how, how much money does everyone lose? And then they, they, it's like their responsibility to make it up on transaction fees. And so like we kind of are going to incentivize the good outcomes, incentivize the bad outcomes. And uh, kind of my, my general attitude is that if you can make a protocol that works under more pessimistic assumptions, it'll, it'll work under more optimistic assumptions, although maybe with unnecessary overhead. And, and Greg, um, you've been working very closely with Vlad on Casper, and I know um, it's been really helpful for a lot of the kind of the, the, the younger generation in the space to benefit from you know a lot of the work and literature that's been done um, in, in consensus mechanisms and in ma you know in math um, previously. What are you kind of seeing as the critical trade-offs and decisions as you help design this? Uh, yeah, well, it, it's quite interesting. There, there are a number of different um, factors that, that come together. One is an issue that uh, I, would, I would love for this space to really become sensitive to, and that's sort of building larger systems out of smaller systems. And right now there's a kind of, in the, in the consensus protocol um, discussion around blockchain technologies, we, we don't see that. There's really a, a need for a kind of global visibility um, that, uh, that, that I think is at the core of a lot of um, scalability issues that are, that are facing these consensus algorithm designs. On the other hand, there's, there's, Vlad makes a very interesting point that, that uh, shifting to economic analysis versus more traditional kinds of analysis is it's, it's very eye-opening. I mean, one of the things that, that has been uh, really captivating my attention recently is, is that liveness properties, uh, so, so whether or not a particular uh, application that's executing against the blockchain will be able to, you know, um, not starve, um, is essentially an economic property. So this is, that's a new world. That's a brave new world. It's fascinating. So, so really kind of seeing old and new come together. And um, Sarah, uh, Peter, you guys have both been obviously in the trenches from the very beginning around Bitcoin. And, um, and I, I remember when the first 
it, it, the early conversations where the understanding was really superficial, you didn't even, even really hear about scalability, you kind of glossed over the 51%, you kind of glossed over the electricity issues. What, uh, what has changed from back then to today? Are, are people now really defining that, that problem space of proof of work consensus protocols? What's being discussed as potential solutions? I'd what are you guys seeing as the trade-offs? I'd point out that, uh, you know, I think the panel here is probably going to disagree among each other. But the way that consensus is maintained has nothing to do with Bitcoin's scalability problem. You know, the scalability problem comes up purely in that we are trying to go make a global system to transfer money around. And money inherently in current blockchain type technologies has a scale problem because anyone could have in the past owned any particular Bitcoin. Therefore, the transaction history has to encompass the entire graph of all transactions. You know, that's your skill bully problem. It's got nothing to do with how you come to consensus. And in fact, in my discussions with banks and other institutions like that in the fintech world, they also are very concerned about the skill bully problems of Bitcoins, even when it's a permission system. Because the moment you have a system which you, where you can't split it up into shards using traditional database techniques, simply because you, know, you can't fully trust every single part of the system completely, because the transaction graph of where did money come from grows you know, quasi-exponentially in any real system to essentially encompass the entire system, in the sense that, for instance, if I give you money, if you trace that backwards to where that money came from, very quickly the entire world's economy would get involved. It might take a year or two, but you know, the, f the rate of flow, um, the velocity of money in real economic systems is extremely high. So if you want to fully trace back money that's the trade-off you have. And blockchain tech has no way of optimizing that currently. There certainly are many possibilities that we can implement, but the current Bitcoin implementation has that property. And our goal at scaling Bitcoin was essentially either A, to determine can you go and fix this problem, and there's various technologies that you can, or B, most of the discussion, I think particularly around the less technical people in the Bitcoin space is essentially, well, why don't we just make it more centralized? Because if you make it more centralized, there's fewer people with that data. Other people are simply trusting those people. And that's an easy trade-off to make. I mean, after all, the Bitcoin network right now can run on a $20 Raspberry Pi. So we've certainly got a lot of headroom there. But that's at the trade-off of trusting people. So just to, to clarify, um, you're saying the, the trade-off that you're identifying there, the design trade-off would be um, the, the sheer amount of, of record keeping you need to have an hit entire history of transactions versus losing that radical transparency and, and that full record, but having gains in fewer people involved to yeah, actually that's absolutely and true. verify those transactions. And for instance, some of the theoretical work I've done is figuring out ways to prove to a, you know, prove to the next party down in the line that their money is real without providing them a full transaction history. I think there are definitely ways to do this. But you must go solve that problem to go solve scale. Whereas I would make the statement that proof of stake systems have nothing to do with this property, um, at least the ones I know of. They're much more about you know, making the system as a whole just use less energy. And you certainly can. It just involves different security trade-offs. I think you, that's an interesting point that you raise, which is that I think once Ethereum's um, proposal came on the scene, uh, it, uh, um, the blockchain technology was no longer just about ledgers. It's about other kinds of applications, right? So my comment before about liveness properties, that was about general applications. So contracts that manipulate the, the, the exchange of digital assets that are not just money. Uh, so that's, that, it's, so I, I think that's, that's a way in which we're, we're kind of talking at cross purposes in a certain way. Right. If we're talking about scaling just a value transfer system, but then you have a general purpose platform that can all execute all sorts of things, it's a much, much larger problem of yeah. greater scale. Yeah. Right. So um, in, the, in the Bitcoin world, in, in, a, in the proof of work world, um, you know, I hear a few proposals floating around. And one thing that actually just puzzles me is why, and hopefully you guys can tease this out and, 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 and speak to what are the nuances are involved in this conversation that make this still a viable proposal, but why is there still talk of increasing the block size when uh, researchers have found that should you increase the block size to that proposed, you actually, um, the Merkle tree flattens, there's no consensus? Well, I'd make the point that, as an example, um, Mike Kern, he published his 
security assumptions. Um, you know, what, what assumptions does he have into designing the system? And there's two really key things in there. One is that he makes the assumption that the majority of miners are honest, not economically rational, but honest, as in they will follow the protocol as written by the software that we say they should run, even when it doesn't earn them as much money as you know, following the protocol in a different way would. And his other key assumption is that we are not trying to defend ourselves against large attackers like governments. You know, if anyone who is that much of an attacker could go destroy Bitcoin anyway, therefore we shouldn't try to defend them. And if you have those two assumptions, I think it's pretty reasonable to say, why don't we have a fairly small number of miners who keep the system secure and we're going to trust them to do their job. And in that kind of world, you do not need to validate the whole transaction history and therefore you don't have a skill problem. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, I'm not sure about the exact question. I, um, I don't really want to speak to the block size debate too much. But I do think it's a question of what sort of what you need to do with the system, right? So I, I really actually, sorry, Peter, I completely agree with what you yeah. said earlier. It's so boring. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in, in looking at other applications, right? So in deciding whether a given transaction should be included in the ledger or not, um, you really don't need the whole entire state of the system. Um, the one thing in Bitcoin, at least, that you're really trying to look at is whether this transaction represents double spending, right? So if I'm saying, oh, I'm sending a Bitcoin to you, Vlad, and then I'm also sort of saying to a different set of people that I'm actually sending it to Constance, then this, we need a way to resolve this, okay? We need a way to decide sort of which transaction came first and which one represents the real spend of this mm -hmm. coin. And so actually, um, I mean, you mentioned sort of, you know, being in Bitcoin for a while. I think in the beginning it was really, you know, whoa, what's this new technology? Does it even do what we want it to do? Um, and I think now we're gaining these deeper insights, right? So this, this one insight is that we don't actually need a full ordering over all Bitcoin transactions, right? We really only need this sort of partial ordering of this, w this way of resolving, you know, if there are conflicting transactions, which one came first? And I do think that this becomes much harder to do when we're talking about complete general purpose computing, you know, what are the potential clashes? But in terms of scalability, I think identifying exactly what we need to sort of achieve consensus on um, is one really useful way to look at this that doesn't, you know, deal with, oh, are you optimistic or you're pessimistic? I yeah. mean, it's really completely... And, and, well, I w and I'd like to go point out, too, that one of the, I mean, from my point of view, you know, and again, um, sort of the exact opposite of, say, the, my current point of view, is that I think it's very important for even people coming into the system newly to know that the previous history was in fact valid. And these kind of optimizations where you go and um, limit what kind of double spend protection you're trying to go and pre um, prevent, they certainly work very well in cases where you can say, you know, this percentage of people in the system are honest. But if you make very pessimistic assumptions like I do that it's, you know, anywhere from 100% down could mm -hmm. be dishonest and manipulative and trying to collude you need very, very, very strong protections that are much, much more difficult and much more um, computationally intensive to go provide I mean, than part, those weakened assumptions. Well, part of the, the, the really big strength of proof of work is the fact that every computer computes and, and checks, verifies for itself. So when you start having a partial history of transactions, you know, the most recent, for example, or, you know, the segregated witness proposal, another example of trimming down some of the record keeping and checking and verification that the nodes have to do, um, you, 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 kind of, you, you then uh, have, you need to trust the nodes in this so-called trustless architecture. So I'm curious, actually, if you agree that that, uh, if you agree that um, you could somehow um, have the same level of, kind of consensus and reliability without, w with this kind of proposal. Yeah, so I actually do think that uh, consensus and scaling are part of the same problem. If you want, to, I think scalable consensus is is a thing, um, and I think that just because you know you only need a total global consensus on like order of some of the transactions doesn't mean that um, you can't also benefit from having um, you know con concurrency within different shards of the consensus, right? So I think that the, the main thing when thinking about scalable consensus is to kind of relax the definition of consensus. Instead of it being a state that everyone has a copy of, it's a state that everyone has an economic guarantee that they can have a copy of. Um, so in, uh, or in fault tolerance analysis, it's a, a guarantee that everyone has a fault tolerance guarantee that they can have 
a copy of this part of the state. So you, you, know, you never at any point actually have identical copies of the state. People have different parts of the state, but everyone has an assurance and under like fault tolerance analysis or economic analysis, depending on the setting, that they can get any of the shards of the state. Uh, and so by kind of relaxing the definition of consensus a little bit like that, uh, you can really talk about what it means to have consensus even though you don't have the full state on which we have consensus. Sorry, can I just clarify? I'm, I wasn't talking about partial views of the history. Mm. I actually think that's interesting to explore as well, but I agree that that is you know, def de uh, determined by how optimistic or pessimistic. Mm. I was talking about partial ordering, right? Mm. So within a block, we right. don't know which transaction came first. So even the full proof of work systems still only achieve a partial ordering on transactions. And I think that we can actually push that insight further. So it has nothing to do with, with trust. So, in, Vlad, in uh, the proof of stake design, you're relying on security deposits um, as an economic incentive, right? Um, what happens when you have actors um, that have motivations or resources that are beyond their economic stake within that network? How do you how do you um, protect against something like that? Well, I mean, so the ba the basic question is. Um, what can an adversary do at what cost to themselves and at what cost to the network and what can the network do to recover? Um, and so depending on what exactly the adversary is interested in doing is going to lose a different amount of money. And if he's motivated by, I would say, a bribe of greater than that amount, then if he's entirely motivated by profit, he might go and take that action. Uh, but the kind of point of these consensus protocols is to kind of m cover the space of things we don't want to happen with these disincentives to do a good job making sure that there's like no profitable way to undermine protocol guarantees. Yeah, but I think implicit in, in uh, Vlad's comment there is that is that linked to the economics are the continued execution of um, the participating validators, right? So so even if, if there are um, contingencies that are, are more interesting to these actors, ultimately their ability to continue to participate in the network is linked to economics. So, so that's the issue. I'd also point out that there's reasonably strong assumptions in these systems, um, these proof of stake systems, about the free flow of data, which is that, you know, if we can imagine this room, if we put a wall right down the middle and half of the room just could not communicate with the other half, in that model and proof of work, you will get a very, very, very strong, absolutely guaranteed, um, gu sorry, guarantee that immediately the hashing power will go down by half on your side of the room because that information cannot propagate to the other side, and you will have some indication that you're being partitioned. Whereas in proof of stake systems, it is possible, maybe unlikely, but certainly is possible, and you can't guarantee this, that both sides could think that they are on the same side of history because your actual key is that actually sign the blocks and you know, sign the fact that they believe that some version of history should move forward. They are not scarce. The keys themselves can go be reused to sign multiple versions of history, and the only way that you get a guarantee, you know, the only, all these economic incentives not to do that are purely based on distribution of information. And if you can't make a strong guarantee about that, you can't make a strong guarantee that there will be consensus. Sure, but once the network reconnects, then uh, everyone who's caught, you know, finalizing blocks on both sides are, are going to lose their security deposits. So the, the, the Which could be in a week after uh, you've lost a ton of money. Yeah, could be. I just had a, um, a question for Greg about, um, I guess, sort of clustering models and whether there's any sort of models um, that you could look at with biomimicry around um, building a like clustering within the decentralized sort of model. Yeah, I mean that's that's essentially what I was talking about before. That uh, that you know, if if you look at the natural world, um, the natural world is amazingly good at scaling, right? <laughs> um, it's 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 really striking uh, how much complexity uh, is e even in your backyard. Uh, and if you think about it from the point of view of computational, or the back of your hand for that matter. Uh, so if you think about it from the point of view of of um, uh, this ability to convert uh, um, basic computational uh, rules into large-scale complexity, how does it manage that? Does the back of your hand need a globally replicated state? No, it doesn't. Uh, and, so, and so, you know, wh what's the magic there? And the, the magic seems to be to push as much out 
to the leaves as possible. So you, 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 and then, and then, and then out of, out of smaller, smaller bits of consensus, these two agree, and these two agree, um, and then these four agree, and then these eight agree. Um, that, that's something that, that, that can scale, and we see this again and again and again. What's interesting about the, the consensus uh, uh, algorithms that are uh, at discussion here is neither of them have these properties. And sort of by design, they can't have this property. So it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it, it's fascinating uh, in uh, to to try to, to to try to bridge this gap. And and part of this has to do with the fact that in the natural world, you you have resources that uh, that that uh, uh, obey a kind of linearity property in a way that that classical bits. Uh, in a computer don't obey. It's really hard to prevent copying of classical bits, right? Whereas it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, you have other kinds of physical resources that are difficult or challenging to copy, right? And that's kind of at the heart of, 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 of this issue. So it's a, it's a great question. Constant, do you, do you mind? I was wondering, uh, how many people here really care about having a scalable blockchain? Right, who's actually really interested in this? <laughs> right, and uh, I wonder if, like, if we could get some kind of indication of why you care. Yeah. Well, I mean, I really don't like to have money that can be counterfeited. <coughs> and making money that's scalable yet can't be counterfeited, I mean, that's just fundamentally way harder than most scaling stuff. You know, usually if I want to talk about scalability and I can go cop you know, make copies of things, that's not a very hard problem. We have tons of examples in CompSci. It's this one little bit about, oh, by the way, you can't counterfeit money that makes all these scaling issues tough. Um, so is, in, um, is anybody looking at um, expiring transactions? So for instance, if you are buying a piece of land, of course, you do need that long-term um, blockchain-based or other technology-based um, ledger. but if I want to buy a can of Coke, why does that need to be stored in the blockchain? Um, in the Bitcoin world, yeah, we're definitely looking at that. And we're looking at layers that would work on top of Bitcoin to reduce the need for consensus as well as collect multiple transactions into one. Uh, one such example, and these often gets called uh, caching layers or non-bandwidth scaling, um, is the Lightning Network, where we go and uh, create relationships between people we wrote transactions through those relationships and we collapse dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of transactions into one that finalize the overall, um, over some period of time, the overall balance of transactions between different parties. And that looks to be an extremely prom uh, promising scaling solution. I'd also point out that currently in Bitcoin we do throw away old data, which is to say that if you trust that at some point the state of the system is this, there's no need to go check all the old transaction history. And currently nodes, um, it's called pruning, nodes can go do this by themselves, just throw away the old transaction state after they've calculated it. And if you know somebody who you trust to have done this correctly in the first place, you can of course just copy their state, not re resynchronize all old history, and then move forward. And I personally, for instance, am working on techniques to um, generalize this so that every transaction you know, when I go give you money, I would give you a sort of summary of just the history related to that transaction, which, again, is one of these sort of techniques, but throwing away data. I, I don't even know if we're still on the same question of Greg throwing a question back to us of why we want to scale the, the blockchain. But um, I think, for me personally, just the, the curiosity, we've got a philosophical divide here around trust. And Vlad, you mentioned it, and I'm curious of your personal you're, you're that inner impulsion, you're, you're what impels you to say this is a trustless environment called the world because I feel like that's where we are. So the illusion of trust in any individual actor is something at the core of solving for humanity. It's, I mean, beyond all of the technical. Um, that to me is why scaling blockchain is incredibly important because saying we have trust versus having trust are very different things. Actually, uh, Peter, I think you were raising. You ha were wearing a great shirt yesterday that said "Don't trust, to verify." Yeah, that was that was the T-shirt at the Scaling Bitcoin conference that they all gave out. Trust, not 
Hi. So, um, so I'm, I'm also curious, you, just going back to your, before we go to the next question, um, I was, uh, was learning about multi-core uh, processing and how they actually are able to synchronize the fact that you don't have one CPU that has all the executable lines of code yeah. and how much work it takes to actually synchronize the different caches, how they work over time in each of these cores. Yeah. Um, and, that, and, and that we're actually at the limit of that processing power now because of light speed. Yeah, no, that's how, absolutely true. I mean, so how does that relate to um, some of these solutions that you're exploring well, with caching? I've actually gone and given this as an example of why um, building scalable applications on Ethereum is very difficult. Because the language that Ethereum runs looks like uh, a standard interpreted language. Yet the architecture that's running on top of, you can think of uh, as a multiprocessor environment. Currently, it isn't actually implemented that way, but it certainly could be in the future by sharding it. So you suddenly have this impedance mismatch between your programming model and how it actually runs, which I believe will lead to people writing applications that inherently make assumptions that don't really scale well and make it very difficult to then split that computational um, need over many different shards. Whereas in Bitcoin, while we don't take, really take advantage of this, we, uh, because it's just transactions, because it's you know, moving money from one party to another, we inherently have this very paralyzable system, except for this long-term verification of history. I think there are techniques to improve on this, but at least because we started off with this programming uh, model in a sense that looks much more parallel, it may be easier to, to make that more parallel. That's, a, that's music to my ears, because uh, the, the, the mathematical model that we're using to, to um, specify Casper and then to reason about it is inherently parallel. So the, the mobile process calculi are, are essentially the best of breed mathematical models for reasoning, uh, specifying and reasoning about uh, concurrent and, and distributed uh, protocols. Um, and one of the proposals on the table right now is a contract language that supplants Solidity and some of the other proposals that's based around the Pi calculus. So, so I, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because I think that's, that, that's, that's co what's coming next. Hi. Um, there's companies like BitPay which are willing to accept the liability of accepting zero conf transactions. Do you think that is a way um, Bitcoin can scale in, in that the regular Bitcoin transactions can happen at a slower rate as a settlement network and people are willing to accept zero confirmation, zero conf transactions for real-time payments? I think you're actually mixing up terms there, but I think you're hitting on something which is very true, um, which is that if you go trust a third party to go and do multiple transactions, it's certainly easier to go and scale by routing those transactions through that third party. However, and I actually did a lot of work on um, building, you know, designing those kind of systems myself. However, I think they're for the most part made obsolete by techniques like the Lightning Network, where you use essentially you can call it smart contracts to enforce um, the fact that this third party has to act in certain ways. In the case of Lightning, yes, the third party can go and hold your money hostage for a period of time, but you're guaranteed to get it back under all circumstances. So your trust fixed, in the third party is relatively low. But have we fixed transaction malleability enough? Yes, we have. It'll uh, probably go live in another day or two with check lock time verify. So actually that, uh, <laughs> um, so you know, you, as, as you can see, what makes the most optimal design of, of all these trade-offs depends on what optimal means to you. So uh, I would be curious to know, um, just I'd, I'd love to hear from each of you guys on what what you guys see as optimal in the universe of trade-offs and what you see as kind of the most promising um, coming out in terms of potential solutions? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, my trust model is super, super pessimistic. Uh, I want to I serve offline nodes that don't trust anyone who's online. Um, I view it as really application specific. I mean, if you are in the Hunger Games, then it, what <laughs> is optimal is very different from if you are, you know, I mean, one application that I've been looking at is, you know, administering benefits. Um, and in this case, you've got like a government department and you're probably already trusting them in some way, like to pay your benefits. Um, and so if you're willing to trust them to do that, maybe you're willing to trust them to do other things. And I'd argue that what's optimal there is very different. Um, so for me, I'm really, pretty fluid with it. It just depends on the setting. 
Mm. I did, uh, you know, one thing that I'm seeing, before we go on, I'd like to hear from you guys as well. Uh, one thing that I'm seeing is a, is a, a bit of a divide, or at least a, a, a gap, a knowledge gap, between um, kind of the architects and designers and mathematicians um, on kind of the abstract way of structuring the different incentive mechanisms um, and coders and engineers who are who are actually confronting implementation problems and the design trade-offs that are involved in that. And uh, sometimes where the, the, the two don't meet, you see this, this big gap. And, you know, one thing that I've been hearing is, you know, one, one example that I heard recently was that if you, on a protocol layer, um, are not able to provide a counter, uh, just, just a simple what, what number came after the number that came before, that on an application layer, it's impossible. So what I'm so pushing off some of the the problems to the, the the developers on the application layer may mean that we haven't addressed some fundamental issue issues on the protocol layer that may prevent some of these things from happening. So I'm wondering, you know, where where you guys see that gap being met and whether that's being considered in these various protocols and experiments. You know, I'd go point out, and I guess in part this comes from my optimism about how well we can scale Bitcoin is. If you have a system available that is trustless, even in scenarios where you could, in theory, trust someone, it often makes sense to go still use that system, at least to provide an additional level of security. A very concrete example is for fintech applications. I've often promoted the idea that even if you have a permission chain where there's a well-defined set of people who sign the blocks in the chain and they determine what the consensus is, it would still be very good to take that consensus, take that consensus state, and, uh, and call it checkpoint it into a chain such as Bitcoin, purely to go always prove to anyone who wishes to go use your system that there's only one copy of history, that you know the consensus hasn't broke down, hasn't started to diverge. And very concretely, you know what this prevents is some hacker from breaking into the maybe three, four, five different servers that go sign the blocks in your chain, determine what consensus is. And we don't want that hacker to be able to take those keys, create an entire divergent history that you don't know about, and then use it to go and, for instance, fool a branch of your company who might be in a different country, doesn't necessarily have a strong guarantee that they're seeing the same view of the world as you do. And if that fails, they can be fooled into doing something that they shouldn't. I once actually wrote up an example of this in uh, the Ripple paper where I go hypothesize, you know, imagine we're trying to move money around and uh, someone's being told off in, say, Iran, oh, by the way, uh, we've got this new deal to go and sell a bunch of oil. You wouldn't want them to be thinking that they're receiving money when someone else isn't. You know, and that's what can happen in these systems when they fail. Whereas additional layers such as proof of work Yes, they may be expensive to maintain, but if everyone in the entire system, in the entire world, uses these systems, the cost per transaction is fairly low, the cost per user is fairly low, and you still provide that extra layer of security. So, yes, you know, permission systems are very valuable, but if the very strong trustless systems exist, there's no reason not to use them in many cases. And Greg, um, in we, terms of your, what your optimal trade-off design might be, what, what considerations? Oh yeah, so if we're, if we're still on that, the optimality yeah. question, yeah. Uh, I'm actually, I'm actually going to reframe it because one, one of the things that, I, that has um, uh, excited me and drawn me to this particular area and this, uh, this debate and dialogue is, is the, the level and quality of engagement. Uh, I think what, what, what would be my optimal outcome is that we work together mm -hmm. to begin to fix some broken incumbent systems. And, and one of the things that, that gives me so much hope that actually like, gets me up in the morning is how many people in this room and, and in many rooms like this room are doing exactly that? And, 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 and most specifically, how many young people are doing exactly that? You know, people, people who, who, you know, I mean, I, I can think of, you know, when, when I was Peter's age or Vlad's age, right, there was, there was, a, there was a lot of disengagement, disenfranchisement, uh, and, and, and just ennui. Uh, and, and what I'm seeing here is people not, not complaining, but rolling up their sleeves and getting in there and saying, hey, let's talk about consensus. And, and that's, that's, that's already beginning to look more optimal to me. 
<laughs> just, just have a quick question, um, not so much on the scalability in context of getting consensus around trust and authentication, but thinking about smart contracts and some of the examples have been given around smart contracts where obviously that, that contract is irrevocable once it's released and being computed, computed by the, the, um, the network or the various nodes. Um, it's probably more a question for Vlad, but um, you can obviously have a badly constructed smart contract that comes up with the wrong outcomes that you didn't expect that you can't revoke. What about poorly constructed code or something that's inefficient in the code in the, within a contract? How do you police against that and prevent that? And Because once the technical debt's out there, if you can't take the contract back, can you, can you rectify that? Sure. So, <clears throat> firstly, I definitely expect this to happen. I definitely expect people to, uh, you know, suffer damages due to badly written contracts. Um, there's the main the main thing you can do now is like just like audit the code through like getting more eyeballs on it. Ideally, you know, we have like formal verification of certain properties of contracts. Um, uh, but the main kind of mitigation isn't just isn't just from whether or not the contract does what you know you said it would do, but whether or not the thing that you specified for it to do is really the thing that you want for your context. And so because of that gap, the gap between like what I think I want my contract to do and what I eventually will want my contract to do once everything plays out, uh, people will probably tend to build in uh, clauses for uh, giving arbiters uh, ability to control the assets of the contract in the event of. Uh, you know, everyone agreeing that things didn't go as intended. Right. Um, but each, but when you do something like that, it it also is a possible vulnerability. So you have to be really careful with these kind of things. Yeah, sorry. Just the, probably the other part I wanted to touch on was: can you construct a smart contract so it's inefficiently coded and hard to compute? Um, yes. So that, yeah. That straight on the, on the scalability of the e yeah, and it also it will increase the cost of using that contract. Yeah, and and to to be clear, I, a lot of the formal verification tools today. Uh, even if we include the very sophisticated ones, the uh, complexity analysis is still way, way into the future, right? You, you might be able to prove that the code is live or it doesn't deadlock or uh, a wide variety of things, but complexity is, is way out there in the future. But fortunately, one of the things that we can do that we, uh, is much harder to do, say, with legal contracts is you can simulate. You don't have to deploy this on some real network. You can deploy it on some imaginary network and, and watch the dynamics over several months to get a sense of, oh, uh, maybe this doesn't quite do what I expected it to do, but maybe it does something better. I'd point out in essentially all practical applications I've ever seen for this tech, the smart contract's always secondary to a legal framework. And the legal framework, if your lawyers aren't stupid, is always going to have an out clause saying, well, if this doesn't go as intended, we're going to agree to let a human judge go figure out what should have happened. You know, that's, <laughs> well, realistically, that's what happens. And it, it isn't good for finality, but unfortunately, I've never seen a scenario where anyone was actually willing to let the code completely determine things. And equally, in many cases, the law isn't going to let you do that either. Yeah, so, the, so actually, one thing that we, we have a working group that's exploring exactly that, what the anatomy of a smart contract and how that interplays with uh, real contracts and legal status of uh, legal enforceability of smart contracts. So, you know, I don't know if you heard in our opening remarks what, you know, one of the reasons why we're called koala um, is because everyone thinks koala is a bear, um, but it's, it's actually not. It's a marsupial. Um, but, uh, it's a mis but it's a misnomer. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah, exactly. We had to come here to learn that. Um, and, uh, you know, the same thing with smart contracts is that, you know, it's just business logic in a script. It's not actually a legal inf legally enforceable contract. You know, just like um, being able to um, have a, a private public key pair means that you control that key. It doesn't actually mean you have ownership, which is a legal construct. So control and ownership are actually distinct. So we, we, like, to, um, we like to import, I guess, uh, a legal framework or some legal understanding, some status of something on some action. And that's where you really run into some problems. So I actually think a huge uh, business opportunity for those of you guys in here would be you know, certification of smart contracts, doing that auditing function, um, certifying you know, on pain of your reputation um, that, that this code did execute in the way that it was intended to do. And we're exploring things right now with um, 
having um, in parallel with some of the, the, the kind of the interface and inputs of smart contracts, having a legal contract actually be documented and have, have that actually be a physical output so that in the edge cases in which the contract doesn't do what it's intended to do, you do have some sort of documentation and recourse and some procedure set into place in, in the, the human RL world. You know, and even in cases like Bitcoin, where you've got this sort of cypherpunk digital ecosystem thing, that's always viewed for, through human expectations. You know, if we ever do a hard fork on the Bitcoin network, fundamentally that means according to the code, the thing that we now call Bitcoin is not the thing that used to be Bitcoin. And that's changing a human notion in much the same way that you can always override the output of a smart contract by getting some lawyers involved and a judge. Yeah, but we, we, we also... Oh, go ahead, Vlad. Sorry, but, the, but there is also an extent to which um, the recourse that comes from the legal contract can't contradict what the contract's poli smart contract's policy says. So if you place a security deposit in a smart contract and it gets into a state where that security deposit can't be returned to anyone, there's no court order that could cause that deposit to be returned because the contract just does not specify a manner in which that is possible at the moment. You're assuming a judge accepts that. No, no, no. It may be that the no, race. No, no, look, the, the, at, the, at the end of the day, a judge is God in his court. Fair, fair enough. That but has been a position for 800 years. Understood. But, but it may be, for example, that a digital asset is, is, is encrypted in a certain way that is, that is unchallengeable and there's no way to get it back. Right? The, the contract trick. That's, that's a different issue. Yeah, but, but, it, but it was <laughs> executed by the agency of the contract. Yeah, but that's a totally different issue. That's available. A judge can't unkill a person. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, question, uh, question, one question up here. So, oh, sorry. I, I, think you, I think you've been waiting, oh, actually. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. My, my, my question sorry. is about... So, so I'm, I'm a bit of a layman when it comes to uh, computerization and everything else like that. I'm just a learned economist, but um, with the property issues and all that and um, putting going to court a few times, but... Uh, what establishments do we actually have in place now that actually legally um, uh, govern um, the, the, what you're just talking now, if there's a, a major problem? Is it international or because these programs go to different countries, um, uh, different societies? Uh, what do we actually have in place and will there be something in place as we move forward? Is that a reasonable question? Sorry, are you talking about governing um, the blockchain as a whole, uh, an agreement that I may have a smart contract involved? Um, maybe a yeah, well, you started touching on about things going wrong and yeah. who would be so, liable yeah. for it. Right. Uh, and I'm sure the, the right. solicitors or the barristers so, are sort of working out so, how much money they can make out of right. it. So, so the, the, just, <laughs> that's really going to be the, the law, issue. So the law exists. The law exists and is waiting. And is waiting for something to test it. And so right now, right, we have a lot of laws around consumer protection, on financial, on, on transfer of assets, on custodian, fiduciary duties, um, uh, unfair competition, um, uh, you know, uh, fraudulent advertising. Lots and there are lots and lots of laws that are waiting for some some case to be taken to court, so that the law can then be applied to this new case. And these are issues of first impression. So the answer is there are. There are many, many different bodies of law that govern many of the actions that we're that we're talking about today. Um, you know how the law will will address it and interpret its framework in the context of these paradigm shifting technologies. A very open question, and and often the law can get it very wrong, as we saw in some of the early internet cases. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the the really one of the key goals of of Koala and our group and and the community that we're gathering is to make sure that we have enough. Um, depth and breadth of understanding from, from technology to math to everything that can go wrong, lawyers, to make sure that we, we are interpreting the law and, and framing the law correctly in the context of these technologies in this new architecture that really changes um, the structure of how, how the legal framework should look like. So, um, so, so yes, there are laws. We're not in an open space. And what that means yet is, is yet to be seen. Um, but we're actually we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, uh, actually, I think you've been waiting, so you can do, do one yeah. question. Uh, I mean, so just back to the yeah. issue of, uh, of if the contract goes wrong and I want to take it to court, 
uh, I need to know who I'm taking to court. Now, with Bitcoin, <laughs> I don't know who I'm going to sue. So, right? yeah, uh, yeah. so I, I, I mean, what that suggests is that we're going to go back to some sort of escrowed identity system, uh, and then we're back into the sort of design that we had with old cryptocurrencies. I hi highly that. encourage you to attend our, our distributed identity uh, and reputation panel where we'll be talking about some of these things. And actually, this gentleman has been waiting very long and very patiently. So uh, it, it was just really about I didn't hear, economic risk models. So how you can vary your economic risk of being pessimistic or, or more optimistic. Uh, Sarah, how, do, how, how have you done any work on that? Um, I haven't because I'm not an economist, um, but I'm very interested in it. Um, we're sort of if you know any economists, um, yeah, we're, we're sort of looking around both within UCL and, and London and the world um, at a lot of these economic questions. So, and, yeah. and actually, we have a, a working group on systemic risk, um, both on monetary policy, capital markets, and otherwise. <laughs> Um, and actually, we, we're working with some UCL professors on that, economists from there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so if you're if you are interested in that group, if you're interested in joining that group or adding to the the paper and the outputs that we have examining these issues, let let us know. Yeah. And thank you guys for being patient, and we'll all be available afterwards. <laughs>